probably no better time to talk about the economic travails in our country than today with all what's, that's happening. Let's take a look at the national debt. When you go home, go to your computer and you can look up the national debt and you'll see that as of 18 September, it was $9.6 trillion. That's nine with 12 numbers after it. Now we have a U.S. population of 304 million. Each citizen's share of this monstrous debt, therefore, is $31,641. The admitted national debt climbs at approximately $1.79 billion per day. And this is even before this bailout. Interest alone on the debt for fiscal year 2007 soaked the American people for $430 billion. That's just interest on the accumulated debt. So that's about $1,400 for every man, woman, and child in our country. But the actual indebtedness of the U.S. government, adding in unfunded obligations into the future, Social Security, Medicare, it approaches at least $50 trillion and maybe as much as $100 trillion. Now, this is what we're leaving for our children, our grandchildren. And I think the slogan that the Education Department has, no child left behind, ought to be applied to the debt. So what do we see? We see this huge indebtedness. No nation in the history of mankind has ever been as heavily in debt as ours. And our leaders have numerous foreign aid programs where they give away money. What are some of the realities that we face today? Well, it costs more every time I go to the supermarket. Everybody says that. My pay raise doesn't even cover rising costs. Two incomes barely keep pace with rising costs. College tuition is out of sight. Good paying jobs are harder than ever to find. And of course, there's a woeful lack of understanding. There are people who today say, you mean there's no backing for the dollar? And then people say, what is the Federal Reserve and how did this affect me? And then I hear people say, we need the Fed because somebody has to manage the currency. Ladies and gentlemen, that is one of the greatest fallacies of all. If, if the currency is a commodity, like gold or silver, it does not have to be managed. The free marketplace will manage it. Money should be a commodity, valuable to all people, and there's no management needed. And so people who say to me, if you get rid of the Fed, what are you going to replace it with? I say, well, if you have cancer, do you want to replace it with pneumonia and two broken legs? Right? No, you don't. So during the lifetime of many Americans, the United States has gone from the greatest creditor nation on earth with the most respected currency to the greatest debtor nation with an increasingly shunned currency. Now that's happened in my lifetime and in the lifetime of many of you here. Now here we have two dollars. Each says one dollar. One is a paper dollar and the other is a silver dollar. The paper dollar will get you one quart of gasoline. The silver dollar will get you as much as 12 quarts of gasoline. But they both say one dollar. Isn't a dollar a dollar anymore? The answer is no, <laughs> it's not. A silver dollar is worth 12 times and maybe more than the paper dollar. And of course, that is changing dramatically as the dollar, the paper dollar, continues to lose its value. Its cause is inflation. Now, let's talk about inflation. It is not rising prices. Don't blame the grocer. Don't blame the gas station attendant, the landlord, or the employer who can't supply a pay raise. Yes, inflation is an increase in the quantity of currency. So then you blame the counterfeiter. You blame the government or the government's partner, the Federal Reserve, for flooding the nation with currency. That's what inflation really is. Rising price is the effect of inflation. Inflation is an increase in the quantity. And you can say that about anything. If a fellow discovered a beach and instead of sand on the beach, it had diamonds and he started to spread the diamonds around the community, the value of diamonds would do what? It would go down. Right? And who would dare, dare give one to his fiance? Any substance whatsoever. Increase the quantity and you will see the value go down. Now I contend, and I'll probably say this again before we finish, 
If you give anybody the power to inflate, he will. Just as simple as that. The, the, uh, the, the temptation to inflate will overcome whatever good intentions might have been had by anybody. If you give anybody the power to inflate, he will. Now you go to a dictionary today and you probably will not get a decent definition. They will equate it with rising prices. They will say it's rising prices and so on. Back in 1957, this dictionary had it correct. It said inflation, an increase in the amount of currency in circulation resulting in a relatively sharp and sudden fall in its value and rise in prices. Note, resulting in rise in prices. So the dictionaries even have been changed. There's two aspects of inflation that are very important. The first is thievery. I have a statement here from John Maynard Keynes, <coughs> a famous British socialist. Keynes did write a book in 1920, and in it, he hit the nail on the head. He said, by a continuous process of inflation, governments can confiscate, secretly and unobserved, an important part of the wealth of their citizens. How does that happen? Well, let's give an example. We'll say a man in 1945 inherited $10,000. He could have bought a home in 1945 for his $10,000. He didn't. He put it in the bottom drawer, and then 50 years later, he took it out of the bottom drawer, and he found out he couldn't even put a down payment on a home. What happened to the value of his money? It was confiscated secretly and unobserved by the government and its partner, the Federal Reserve. Now, you can, all kinds of examples can be given for that. But there is an example of what happens. Secretly and unobserved, this man's money continued to lose value. What we are seeing <clears throat> through inflation is what, what I like to call reverse Robin Hood. You all know Robin Hood. He stole from the rich to give to the poor. And today, the Fed and the government are stealing from the poor and the middle class to give to the rich. Reverse Robin Hood is where we are today. And we've got to stop it. And I think we can. But inflation is not only thievery. Inflation can destroy a nation. In 1946, Henry Hazlitt wrote a book. And in it, he said, inflation tears apart the whole fabric of stable economic relationships. It drives men toward desperate remedies. It leads men toward demand totalitarian controls. It ends invariably in bitter disillusion and collapse. Now, I put a chart up here of the value of the Reichsmark in Germany. As some of you probably know, at the end of World War I, Germans, the German people were, it was demanded of them that they pay reparations for what the war had accomplished and, and the destruction that, that had been wreaked. So the German government, in order to pay off, started inflating the currency. And you look at the top of this chart, you see it says one U.S. dollar converts to, in January of 1922, 189 Reichsmarks. And then it went to 303, and then 1800, then 7,000. And you can see it gradually going up, 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 up. And finally it went in October of 1924 to 4.2 trillion Reichsmarks for one U.S. dollar. And at that point the German government just reclassified the currency and they said one trillion Reichsmarks is now one new Rentenmark. Now what did that do to Germany? Well, the people lost their homes, they lost their farms, they lost their business, and they became very bitter. Can it get that bad here? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, look at that chart. Can we suffer the same problems? Yes. And what happened in Germany? Go back to what Hazlitt said. He said it leads men to demand totalitarian controls. And so the German people were finally offered a fellow who said he could restore German pride and he would put Germany back on its feet again. And his name, you know, was Adolf Hitler. And totalitarian controls followed. So inflation is not only thievery, inflation can destroy a nation and it can destroy ours if we don't get it stopped. Here's a letter that was written from Germany to an American citizen with an Italian name, Attilo Enui. The date on the letter is December of 1925. He wrote to the Deutsche Bank in Berlin and he asked what happened to his one million marks deposit. And they went through a nice letter and I underlined and blew up 
the key part. They told him the balance on your account has, in fact, been wiped out. Can that happen to your balances and mine? Yes, it can. Let's talk about money for a bit. There's three kinds of money, only three kinds of money. The first is commodity money. And it can be gold, it can be silver, it can be coins or bars. <clears throat> it can be platinum, it can be something else. You go back over history and you find that gold and silver have been decided upon as good money throughout the course of history. You will even find gold and silver mentioned as currency in Holy Scripture, written 2,000 years ago. Well, the next kind of money is fiduciary money. And the word fiduciary comes from the Latin word that means trust. And so fiduciary money is essentially valueless substitute for commodity money, but its value is based on trust, that it can be exchanged for commodity money. And so gold or silver certificates that were exchangeable for gold or silver are fiduciary money. And then the third kind of money is fiat money, again Latin. Fiat is an edict, a dictate. Fiat money is a valueless substance. It's made legal tender by law. It becomes money as a result of government edict, not redeemable in either commodity or fiduciary money. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our country had commodity money until the 1930s and into the 70s even. Then we had fiduciary money, and now we have fiat money. And fiat money is like monopoly money. The only reason it still has value is because the government has said, you must accept it as legal tender for all debts, public and private. But that can change as well. Money has to be an accepted commodity. What has history shown us have been used as commodities for money? Amazingly, cattle were used as money, but there were problems and cattle had to be fed. You couldn't divide up the cattle for small transactions. You'd kill the money. Seashells were used, but they were fragile. They broke and then they become less valuable. Salt was used as money, and it's from the use of salt as money that we get our word salary. That's where it comes from. But salt was easy to find and easy to inflate. Nails were used as money, but they rusted. And even tobacco was used as money, but it rotted. And they discarded that as money too. So throughout the course of history, men have decided gold and silver. It could use platinum, but gold and silver are the most common. Gold is divisible, transportable, it's durable, and it's scarce. It's scarce. It can, gold cannot be inflated. It's durable. You could put a bar of gold in the ocean where it's, anything else would just rust and disappear, a bar of uh, steel or ironwood. You come back a year later, you've still got your bar of gold. Sel silver is good as well. Not as good as gold, but good. This decision to use gold and silver was not decided by some government agency. No. The accumulated wisdom of mankind decided to use gold and silver. Now let's get into the important feature of what does the Constitution of the United States say about money. And there's only two places. The first place is Article 1, Section 8, I guess it is. Congress shall have power to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. All right, what does that mean? What power was given to Congress in the Constitution of the United States? Its first power was to establish a mint, to stamp the people's precious metals into coinage of a fixed size, weight, and purity. Ladies and gentlemen, that spurred commerce. If you had coinage that people now knew what the value was because they knew it was so many ounces or, or portions of an ounce, it was pure, and it was a fixed size, re readily recognizable. It made commerce very much more simple. And it's one of the reasons why our country began to take off. They started the Mint in 1791, just right after the Constitution had been ratified. And the Mint, of course, the people would bring their gold and their silver to the Mint and ask for the Mint to stamp it into coinage. No charge. 
If you wanted, however, you could bring your gold and silver and say, look, I'm in a hurry. I need it tomorrow or two days or something like that. Then you could pay a fee to the mint in order to have it done speedily. Now, that constitutional power also says determine and then publish the value of various foreign coinage. The most common coinage in our country at the time of the War for Independence was Spanish pieces of eight. And if you've ever seen one of them, it's actually slotted. It's like a, 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 a pizza pie with the slices already through it. And you could break off pieces of it. Pieces of eight is what they called it. And if you broke off two of them, you had two bits a quarter. And that's where that phrase comes from. Two bits was a quarter. Four bits was a half. So the government was given the power to determine what the value of foreign coinage was. They were not only Spanish pieces of eight, but they were doubloons, they were this, they were that, they were something else. And the government said, well, these are worth this, these are worth that, and these are worth something else. And that, too, spurred commerce. And finally, the government was given power, the Congress, the power to create a standard of weights and measures to facilitate normal transactions. There will be 12 inches in a foot. There will be 5,280 in a, in a mile. There will be 16 ounces in a pound, and so on. And that's all that Congress was granted in the Constitution of the United States. Were they given power to start a bank? No. Were they given power to transfer power that they didn't have to the Federal Reserve to start something? No, of course not. Now, that's so little known, but it has to be known. All right, the other portion of the Constitution where money is mentioned is prohibitions on the states. Now, you've got to realize that the men who went to the Constitutional Convention were very jealous guardians of state power. And one of the things that lost here in America is that the states created the federal government, not the other way around. The creature has become greater than its creator, and that's, of course, wrong. And so the people who went from the different states to the Constitutional Convention willingly said, no state shall coin money or emit bills of credit. And that's the term for paper money that was used at the time of the founding of our country. Bills of credit, paper money. And no state shall make anything but gold and silver a tender in payment of debts. And that's all the Constitution said about money. What was the attitude of the founders regarding paper money? They had already experienced the Continental Congress issuing the Continental Currency. If you're as old as I am, or maybe you remember your parents saying something was not worth a Continental. That was a common phrase in our country. They weren't talking about the automobile. <laughs> A continental was the currency. They actually paid the troops that fought in the war for independence with worthless paper money. They didn't have any choice, I guess, but what they did was wrong. So look what some of the founders said. These are the men who went to the Constitutional Convention. Ellsworth from Connecticut, he didn't stay for the whole thing, but he was there for long enough. He said, shut and bar the door against paper money. James Wilson of Pennsylvania, remove the possibility of paper money. Pierce Butler of South Carolina, disarm the government of such power. And I love this last one from New Hampshire. John Langdon said, I would reject the whole Constitution if paper money is not barred. They knew what had happened with paper money, and they didn't want it to happen again. James Madison is the father of the Constitution. Look what he said. The extension of the prohibition to bills of credit must give pleasure to every citizen in proportion to his love of justice and his knowledge of the true springs of public prosperity. The power to make anything but gold and silver a tender in payment of debts is withdrawn from the states on the same principle with that of issuing paper currency. Let's take a look at currency. We'll, we'll draw a picture here of what has happened. I have pictured here a 1907 U.S. Treasury gold certificate. It actually says on it, this certifies that there have been deposited in the Treasury of the United States $10 in gold coin payable to the bearer on demand. The finest paper money the world has ever known. American currency that used to be known as good as gold was because of this. In 1933, President Roosevelt took us off the gold standard. He, he barred the American people from owning gold. 
He asked the American people to turn in their gold for paper certificates. Ninety percent of the American people did. The promise was that as soon as we get out of the Depression, we'll give you back your gold. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Did it? So those gold certificates went out. We went then to silver certificates. 1935. It was 1933 when President Roosevelt did what I just said. Now these were also U.S. Treasury notes. And it says on the top, this certifies there is on deposit in Treasury of the United States of America one dollar in silver, payable to the bearer on demand. And that was good money. But that disappeared courtesy of Lyndon Johnson in 1968. So let's go back now. The Federal Reserve was begun in 1913. And one year later, the Federal Reserve began to issue its own currency. Now, this one's dated 1928, but a similar bill could have been put up here from 1914. And up here in the top, it says, redeemable in gold on demand at the United States Treasury or in gold or lawful money at any Federal Reserve Bank. Now, keep in mind that until 1933, gold certificates were still functioning, still being distributed. And these had to compete with the gold certificates from the Treasury. And so the Federal Reserve was very, very careful in saying that, yeah, their, their notes are also redeemable in gold. Until President Roosevelt took us off the gold standard. Then we went to the next kind of Federal Reserve note. And this one says up here, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, and is redeemable in lawful money at the United States Treasury or any Federal Reserve Bank. Then there's the famous story about the fellow who took a $20 bill to a bank. And he put it up on the counter and he said to the girl teller, he said, yeah, yes, miss, I, I'd like some lawful money, please. And she said, what do you want, two tens or four fives? And he said, no, no, if you give me those, they also say it's redeemable in lawful money. If it's redeemable in lawful money, it can't be lawful money. I'd like some lawful money. And he smiled. And she went and got the boss. <laughs> The boss came out and said, uh, sir, what can I do for you? Uh, I'd like some lawful money for my 20, thank you. Uh, what is it that you consider lawful money? He said, gold. Sorry, can't give you gold. It's against the law. Thank you very much. Give me back my 20. You've proven my point, and out the door he went. So the Federal Reserve <clears throat> decided then they wouldn't say redeemable and lawful money anymore. And this is what you have in your pocket or purse today. And it says this, the, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, redeemable in nothing. nothing. Nada. Zilch. The amount of which, the value of which, the interest rates on which are set by a private agency called the Federal Reserve that is beholden to no one. Imagine. And in just in my lifetime, we've gone from the finest paper money the world has ever known to totally irredeemable fiat currency. Now, it's not valueless today. We will still accept it for your lunch. We will still accept it for, <clears throat> for the books and the DVDs that are for sale. But you know and everyone who is sensible knows that you can buy less today than you could yesterday, and it's only going to get worse. Every once in a while, you get some help from an unexpected source. In 1993, January, National Geographic magazine published an article called The Power of Money, written by one of its editors, Peter T. White. And in his article, Mr. White relates that he had just been told by a Fed official that the Fed had purchased 100 million in treasury bills from some securities dealers. He related his exchange with the Fed official as follows. Peter White said, where did the Fed get that $100 million? We created it, a federal official tells me. He means that any time the central bank writes a check, so to speak, it creates money. It's money that didn't exist before, he says. Is there any limit on that? And the Fed official says, no limit, only the good judgment and conscience of the responsible Federal Reserve people. Sleep well, my friends, sleep well. Where did they get that vast authority? He said, it was delegated to them, Federal Reserve Act of 1913, based on the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Congress shall have power 
to coin money, regulate the value thereof, which is a bald-faced lie, and that Fed official may have even believed that. I don't know. I don't know who he was. But we just went over what that portion of the Constitution says, didn't we? And it does not say that there is no limit on the amount of paper money that can be created out of thin air by the Federal Reserve. Let's go to the Federal Reserve, and here we have a fellow named Paul Volcker. First of all, he joined the Council on Foreign Relations in 1970. And if you don't know about the Council on Foreign Relations, please, please find out about it. We have the book, The Shadows of Power, over there. These are the people who run our country. The Shadows of Power will tell you who they are and how they operate. In 1979, he was named to be the head of the Federal Reserve. During his testimony to Congress, they have a quasi-relationship with Congress. He said, the standard of living of the average American has to decline. I don't think you can escape that. Alan Greenspan in the 60s was a hard money gold bug. And in a book he wrote, in the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. He's absolutely right about that. But then he joined the Council on Foreign Relations in 1978. And then he was named chairman of the Federal Reserve in 1987 and he did that for 20 years. These are the kind of men. And that they come from the Council on Foreign Relations is no surprise. Today it's Ben Bernanke. He's not yet a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, but he's a Greenspan disciple. In 1993, a man I knew in Pennsylvania finally got his congressman to do something. <clears throat> he had been badgering the man, where does the Fed get the authority to do what it's doing? And the congressman couldn't answer. In fact, most congressmen can't answer. So the, fi the congressman finally wrote to Greenspan and he said, please help me out here. And you can see this letter. It came back from the Federal Reserve and that's Alan Greenspan's name there and that's his signature down at the bottom. He said, consequently, while no state government may emit bills of credit or make anything but gold or silver a, ten a legal tender in payment of debts, the federal government is not limited in what it may designate as legal tender and do what it's doing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that needs a very big explanation, all right? We said at the beginning that the Constitution of the United States empowers government with very few functions. In fact, of all of the things that governments have done throughout history, the Constitution of the United States empowered our government to do 5% of them. In other words, you are barred from 95% of what governments like to do. If you have Greenspan's attitude, however, he says that if we are not prohibited from doing something in this, we can go ahead and do it. And that means that he will now do 95% of things that governments throughout history have wanted to do. That is a marvelous transformation. And that is the attitude of many people in the Congress of the United States today. My own congressman, I recently asked him about it. He said, well, we're not prohibited from doing it, so we can go ahead and do it. I hope, you, I hope you grasp how important that is. Now, Greenspan's not the only one who has said that. Franklin Roosevelt said that. A lot of others have said that. But here we have it in print. The Federal Reserve, an unelected few, appointed to its Board of Governors by the President for 14-year terms, have been awarded completely unconstitutional power to decide the amount of currency, establish the value of the currency, set the interest rates on it, and create booms and busts. The Federal Reserve is the brainchild of Edward Mandel House. House was President Woodrow Wilson's top advisor. He wrote in his own 1912 book, Philip Drew Administrator, that he was working for, quote, socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. It was House who later founded the Council on Foreign Relations. When the U.S. Senate said no to the League of Nations that he and Wilson tried to promote, they decided to form an organization to persuade the American people to want world government. That's what the Council on Foreign Relations is. And of course, if we get world government, you can scrap what's in this little book. We will now be under the United Nations. I put a quote at the bottom here from the famous leader of the Rothschild banking empire. Let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who writes the laws, because if I control the nation's money, the people who write the laws will do what I want. That's what he said. And that is so true. 
There were a few who saw the danger in 1913 when the Federal Reserve was created. Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, senior of Massachusetts, he said the bill as it stands seems to me to open the way to a vast inflation of the currency. Charles Lindbergh, the father of the famous aviator, was a Republican congressman from Minnesota. He said the new law will create inflation whenever the trusts want inflation. And remember what I said. You give anybody the power to inflate, and he will. You can count on it. Then we see Wright Patman, a Democrat from Texas, 1968. He's the powerful head of the House Banking Committee. And he said in the United States today, we have in effect two governments. We have the duly constituted government. Then we have an independent, uncontrolled, and uncoordinated government in the Federal Reserve. He, as the head of the House Banking Committee, was saying he had no influence over the Federal Reserve. He had no power to control what they were doing. They are an independent government, he said. And yes, they are. And they still are today. It was only a little while ago that the Congress of the United States decided to raise the national debt ceiling. They raised it to 10 trillion, 200 billion, 10.2 trillion. They're almost there. Now, Paulson and Bernanke want the, the government to give 700 billion more to use to bail out their friends, yes, right? To supposedly stop the bleeding of the U.S. economy, which it might do for a couple of months, that's all. And so they've also asked Congress to raise the debt ceiling to $11 trillion. All during the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, the American people were living high on the hog, and we were all doing well, and everybody was happy. It was a prosperous country. You know, don't worry about the Federal Reserve. You know, what, whatever they're doing is fine with me. I don't care. Now people are beginning to care. The chickens have come home to roost. We talked about Marx and the fact that Edward Mandel House got his cue from Marx, and he said it in his own book. He was working for socialism, as dreamed of by Karl Marx. The Communist Manifesto. Famous 10 planks, number two, a heavy progressive income tax. Number five, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. That's the Fed, except <clears throat> that we've gone one step beyond even what Marx wanted. He wanted it in the hands of the state. Ours is in the hands of a private entity known as the Federal Reserve. You've all seen an individual tax return, so let's talk about income tax for a while. It accounts for 40% of government revenue. Where does the other 60% come from? Well, it comes from legitimate taxation. There is a form of taxation in the government, excise taxes and so forth. And it comes from borrowing. Now, if they borrow, where do they borrow from? Right now, they're borrowing from China. They're borrowing from China. Communist China. Richard Nixon dignified the Chinese, and the Chinese have taken advantage of the dignity supplied and now they are the United States creditor. And so the, the billions and billions that China is lending to the United States has put our nation in another noose. Now go back to what happened regarding money. President Roosevelt took us off the gold standard. President Lyndon Johnson took us off the silver standard. But until 1971, the American people couldn't exchange their dollars for gold, but foreigners could. Actually, foreigners could. Maybe you remember the term gold flow. Our gold was leaving the country. Foreigners were cashing in their dollars and taking the gold. They were emptying Fort Knox. And it was Richard Nixon that put an end to that and cut forever any tie of US currency to precious metal. The same man who went to China and dignified Chu Enlai and Mao Zedong, the bloodiest murderers the, war, the world has ever known. Ever. So 40% of government revenue comes from the income tax. If the income tax were abolished today, government spending would revert all the way back to only to 1997. You can see how fast the government is growing, how much greater the spending is, and so forth. Now, there are people who say abolish the income tax. 
And I say abolishing it without reducing a great deal of government spending would only bring more debt, more inflation, or both. I wouldn't want that. I want to abolish the income tax. But I want a, a corresponding cutting back of government agencies. Which ones? Well, let's start with foreign aid. <laughs> and then let's Department of Education and Housing and Welfare and Medicine and Transportation and so on and so on and so on. Go back to states. States running their affairs. And yeah, there will be some states that will blow it, but there was competition amongst the states. One of the pieces of brilliance of the Founding Fathers set up competition among the states to be the best state, the one way you'd want to come and raise your family and start a business and so forth. Competition always produces excellence. We have no competition in the money field. It's a monopoly headed by the Federal Reserve. So let's analyze where we've been. How can all of what we've talked about be explained? Is it stupidity? Are you going to tell me Alan Greenspan is stupid? No. Is it ignorance? No. No, neither he or the leaders of our government, the presidents and the vice presidents and the heads of the committees and the big congressmen and so forth, they're not ignorant of what's going on. Well, if it's not stupidity and it's not ignorance, maybe it's design. And I said before that occasionally you get help from an unexpected source. There's a fellow named David Rockefeller. And he's writing here in his own book, Memoirs. And he's talking about his family. And he said, some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. Ladies and gentlemen, our leaders aren't stupid. They aren't ignorant of facts. Therefore, it's hardly unreasonable to conclude that there is a design behind what is occurring. We're not fighting against people who believe in what they're doing is good for mankind. No, it's good for themselves. It's good for power base for building power, for personal aggrandizement, and so forth. Now we have Secretary of the Treasury and the head of the Federal Reserve getting together to say that they want $700 billion more to get us out of a problem that was started because government was not doing its job in the first place. And they have even said that they want this without the Congress having anything to say about it. Right? That's, that's pretty incredible, pretty arrogant, pretty conspiratorial in my view. The Constitution that we so revere says all bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House. If the House will not originate the $700 billion bailout, that's it, according to the Constitution. And so we say, we take our country back through the House of Representatives. That's where the power of the purse is. A mere six days after I delivered these remarks in Denver, huge public pressure encouraged the House of Representatives to reject the multi-billion dollar bailout bill. But the Senate crafted and passed its own version on October 1st, just a few days later. The original three-page bill had ballooned to some 400 pages with $150 billion added. Then, with ongoing economic turmoil in the markets, enormous wheeling and dealing pressed the House to pass the Senate's version of the $850 billion bailout bill. They called it the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008. The House did so on October 3rd. As of November 4, the national debt now stands at 10.58 trillion dollars and is expected to continue to grow by two to four billion dollars per day. Two weeks after Congress passed the bill, British Prime Minister Gordon Brown penned an op-ed piece in the Washington Post stating that global problems we face require global solutions. Accordingly, he called for global governance and a world trade agreement. Brown reflected positively on the accomplishments of American and European visionaries who built a new international economic order. That's the new world order. Now he and leaders of other nations are calling for the boldest of global cooperation to create rules for our new global economy. 
All of this, of course, would mean a further loss of American independence coupled with more international controls over our economy. So what can we do about all this? First, competing currencies must be established. Repealing the legal tender law that says only Federal Reserve currency is legitimate is imperative. With its monopoly status, the Fed has been able to inflate the currency at will, debasing its value and robbing the poor and middle class of their savings, purchasing power, and investments. Once the Fed's currency is given some much needed competition, sound money based on real commodities, such as gold and silver, will drive out fiat currency that is backed by nothing. Second, in tandem with the introduction of a competing currency, a corresponding reduction of taxes and government spending must also take place. Congress, as well as state and local governments, must be pressured into fiscal responsibility. As long as governments are allowed to spend wildly, the Fed will inflate the currency to cover the shortfall, or there will be more borrowing from China and elsewhere. Third, as fiat currency is replaced by sound money, urge your congressman to support legislation to abolish the Federal Reserve. Congress started it. Congress can end it. Fourth, state legislators should introduce resolutions to exert additional pressure on Congress to allow the creation of sound money. None of these welcome developments will happen in a vacuum. They will only come to pass when concerned citizens join together to exert sufficient constituent grassroots pressure on their representatives and senators. I heartily recommend that you link up with others by joining a JBS.org Freedom Campaign Meetup group. With an alliance of thousands of groups across the country, Americans can begin the process of restoring sound money, ending wild spending, and abolishing the Fed. We also invite all of those viewing this program to go to JBS.org and become a free online member of our society. Once you do join, you'll get updates, legislative alerts, and the important information needed to remain free. While working with others, educate yourself about the nature of money, inflation, the Federal Reserve, and economic freedom. One book we highly recommend is The Creature from Jekyll Island. Of course, we also recommend our affiliate magazine, The New American. Time is running out to get our country back on track with limited government, free market economics, and sound currency. Get involved today. Thank you very much, and may God bless America.